By the late 1940s, labor organizations had become a powerful force in America. The government worked with unions to prevent work stoppages, but widespread fear remained about the crippling effects of large-scale strikes. In response, Congress, over President Truman's veto, passed the Taft-Hartley Labor Act in 1947, which limited the negotiation tools unions had in collective bargaining disputes. This did nothing to soothe the contentious relationship between Congress and the president, who had been vocal in his criticism for the do-nothing Congress in his re-election campaign. Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company v. Sawyer involved a labor dispute in the early 1950s between steel mill owners and employees about their collective bargaining agreements. The two sides were unable to come to terms even after federal mediators arrived to help. The workers prepared to strike. At the time, the United States was involved in the Korean War, and steel was needed for the military. President Truman believed the reduction in steel production from a strike would compromise national defense. He issued an executive order instructing Secretary of Commerce Sawyer to take control of the nation's steel mills and ensure uninterrupted production. Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company and other mill operators sued Sawyer in federal court. Youngstown alleged that the president's order was unconstitutional because it amounted to legislation, which was Congress's proprietary role. The government argued that because the president was acting in response to a national emergency, the order was authorized under the aggregate of his constitutional powers as the nation's chief executive and the commander-in-chief. The district court granted an injunction on the ground that the president had exceeded his constitutional authority, but the Court of Appeal, sitting en banc, temporarily stayed the injunction. The Supreme Court granted certiorari to consider whether the president had exceeded his executive powers when he issued the order. Writing for the majority, Justice Black held that the president could only act where he had been expressly or implicitly authorized to do so by the Constitution or Congress. The executive branch could not cite any express constitutional justification for the order, and the court rejected as too attenuated the Solicitor General's argument that the president's power should be implied. Justice Black found that the war powers granted to the executive by the Constitution did not apply because there had been no declaration of war, and no other constitutional provisions conveyed this authority. Justice Black noted that Congress expressly rejected the use of seizures to solve labor disputes during the drafting process of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947. Thus, the executive order could not be justified by any statutory authorization either. Given the concurring and dissenting opinions in this case, there has been some debate over the exact limits of the president's authority. Justice Jackson's famous concurrence outlines the authority of the president to act. Where Congress has expressly or impliedly granted power to the executive, the president may rely upon his own powers and those of Congress. Where Congress is silent, the president may rely only on his own authority, though there is a zone of twilight where the president and Congress may have concurrent powers. Lastly, where the president acts contrary to the will of Congress, his power is at its lowest ebb. Jackson found that Congress had explicitly refused to grant the executive the power to seize real property to avoid labor disputes, and that Truman had acted unconstitutionally. Justice Douglas concurred to say that only Congress could appropriate money to compensate owners for a nationwide seizure of property. Therefore, the power to seize private property rested squarely with Congress. Justice Frankfurter wrote a concurrence to point out that while the executive has been granted the authority to make large-scale seizures in the past, Congress had granted temporary powers during war or national emergency. Finding neither condition present, Frankfurter believed Truman's order was unconstitutional. Justice Burton, in his concurrence, found that Truman acted outside his authority because he did not abide by the procedures authorized by Congress in the Taft-Hartley Act and had no inherent power to act on his own. Justice Clark's concurrence concluded that the executive's independent power to act depends on the gravity of the situation, but he did not find the labor dispute to be severe enough to warrant the president's executive order. Justice Vinson wrote the lone dissent, arguing that the president's order was necessary to prevent a crisis of national defense that could result if work stoppage caused steel shortages. 
the Youngstown decision was a sharp and unexpected blow to President Truman's policy ambitions, and Truman made his displeasure known. Justice Black extended an olive branch by inviting Truman to a party. Truman eventually made peace with the justices, telling Black, Hugo, I don't much care for your law, but by golly, this bourbon is good. If you found this video helpful, you can explore all of our content by visiting us at Quimby.com. If you have a question or comment about this case, please post it in the comments area below and we'll do our best to get back to you. If you think we did a good job with this video, please like, share, and favorite it. And if you think this video might be helpful to people you know, please share on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus as well, to get this video out there. If you haven't done so already and you enjoy watching videos on this channel, click on the red subscribe button just below this video so you can get all the latest updates.